All right, from the top. This is a nice of them. This is where you take people when it's time to arrest them. Yes, I understand my rights. No, I don't need a lawyer. Yes, no lawyer. What are you going to arrest me for? I didn't murder Simon. You've got it wrong. You've got the wrong person. Yes, I'll take a lie detector test. I've never taken a lie detector test before. Does it really work? Yes, my name is Hannah Smith. Oh, shit. Sorry. My name? That was the only question I failed. <laughs> Your lie detector works. My mother called me Eve. Well, she wasn't my real mother, but she raised me. Do you want to hear the story? It's a real life fairy tale. Across the road, where my parents first lived there, was a midwife called Florence. When Hannah was born, I was born at the same time. The midwife was there to help. I'd been throttled by the cord, probably wrapped around my neck by Hannah. The midwife told my mother I was dead. But I wasn't. She wrote all this stuff in a diary. Amazing what people will admit to on paper. Florence took me home with her. Mother hadn't been expecting twins and had a healthy baby. I guess she was just happy for Florence to clean up. Take away the evidence that this was anything but a happy occasion. Florence raised me in her home. I never left it. She kept me out of sight. It wasn't odd for people to see a midwife with a baby, carrying in supplies, washing nappies, that sort of thing. I never knew any different. I grew up looking out of my window and seeing her across the road. I thought it was like a reflection in the mirror. She was me. <clears throat> yes. The first time we saw each other, it was strange. We both realized at the same moment, I think. We must have seen each other before, but there was this instant when we first realized it wasn't a reflection. The reflection was staring back. I think I was five. It was my birthday. My reflection was wearing a party hat and waving. I knew what party hats were from books. And it suddenly occurred to me, today must be my birthday. I waved back and we just spent ages waving at each other and copying each other's movements. Mother wanted me to grow my hair long, but I kept cutting it myself. I wanted to look like my reflection. She always had short hair when she was little. Mother would hide the scissors, but I would find a way. Cut it with a bread knife, something like that. My reflection would always leave her house 
and go on adventures, but I never could. Mother taught me at home, and I had books and TV. Oh, TV was magical, but it was only on when it wanted to be, so I spent a lot of time reading books. Fairy tales. Stories about lost princesses, evil witches, magical mirrors and lost children. So you see, even before I knew the truth, I'd found it in those stories. Florence was a warm, kind person. But she was broken, I guess. When I found her diary, I also found a biscuit tin with other stuff in it. Older papers, letters, that kind of thing. Her story was in there. I never really spoke to her about it. I was far too young to really understand. I guess I just put it together later, once I was older. She had loved children, planned to have a large family, but her husband died in the war. And that was back when you married for life. She never felt like she could marry again. Isn't that strange? She was a widow from her twenties. But, I mean, I guess it was different then. You know, you married for life and she felt she could never marry again. I guess it was harder, a war widow. One of the dead. I, I don't know, maybe there was more to it than that. I don't really know. No, it was just me and her. It was the name they were going to call their first child. They talked about it and I'm going to try when it came back. Florence's family had a history of first-born girls, so they were convinced it was going to be a girl. It's hard to know if this is all true. These are stories I remember that I read when I was a child. Maybe I misread, maybe I misunderstood. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to remember what happened last week. Um, when I was eight, mother died. She slipped down the stairs. It was an accident. I had read a diary at that point and I knew she wasn't my real mother. So I burned the diary that day and I left. Walked out and across the street. I wanted to see my reflection. I thought that if I touched her, something would happen. We would become one. One girl. The fairy tale was over, the witch was dead, and I'd be restored to my rightful place. Mm. She recognised me from the window. She told me to come inside and she hid me. They had made the attic into a place where Hannah could play. There was a dollhouse. She hid me up there. No one else ever went into the attic. It was her place. I'm not sure where the dollhouse came from. I don't know if it was given to them or they inherited it. I mean, they wouldn't have had the money to buy it. It was so huge. It must have been taken up to the attic in parts and then reassembled up there. It is a beautiful thing. Wallpaper to scale. Little furniture. The lights work. Mirrors, beds. 
like duvets and pillows. We spent hours and hours playing in it. We invented all these characters and families who lived there. We wrote paperwork for them all. Passports, diaries, we gave them all really elaborate stories. Once a moth got trapped in there, we'd left a light on. It was making the most horrendous noise. We tried to kill it, but it was tough. We ended up crushing it under a copy of the Arabian Nights. It just became our way of life. We would swap places and take it in turns to do things. And we were very careful. Whoever had been out that day would come back and write a detailed diary so that we were on the same page. We had a list of rules that said what we could and couldn't do in any given situation. I mean, it was exhaustive. We lived a second life through those rules. Rules for things that could only ever happen inside our imaginations. I mean, we would consider all the permutations of future events and agree rules to walk our way through them. If one of us got hurt, the other one would have to be hurt too. A grazed knee, a bruise. When I lost my tooth first, we had to pull our hands to match. Once, I slept with a boy who was seeing another girl the girlfriend came up to Hannah the next day and punched her in the face, gave her a huge black eye. That night, she had to do the same to me. And she almost went too far. I couldn't see out of that eye for days. And she snapped a frozen piece up for me from the kitchen. Mm. So much of our bodies were synchronised anyway. We started our period on the same day, all our childhood diseases, stomach bugs, nits. Mum and Dad had never had any reason to notice. They were always busy. If Hannah was eating a lot, they didn't mind. She didn't put on any weight. That girl has a healthy appetite. Um, if they heard us talking in the attic, they just thought it was Hannah playing one of her games. And that Eve was our imaginary friend. <laughs> Once, she was already up and dressed and ready to go to school and I snuck down for a piss. Mum saw me in my underwear and she went mad. Get dressed this instant! So I ducked into our bedroom <laughs> and seconds later, out came Hannah, dressed and ready. My mum was amazed. When we weren't together, we'd send secret messages by tapping out a code that we'd learned from a book. The knock code. Something prisoners of war would use. We'd tap them out on radiator pipes or the attic floor. We loved our cat, Domino. Um, he had this little bell around his neck to stop him from killing birds in the garden. And we used to write each other notes and put them in the bell and we could send them to each other. Mum found some of the notes once and she thought I was just writing to myself because our handwriting was identical. And we had our own words for things, so she didn't quite understand them anyway. We were obsessed with fairy tales. Not just the pretty, pretty ones, but the traditional ones. They were dark and real, bizarre and violent. Felt like life. We had this huge old book that I think Mum's bought from a library sale. 
the illustrations had thin tracing paper over them to protect them. They were in colour, shiny plates. At the front of the book was an index of illustrations. We read that more than the actual stories. We'd read aloud the captions and flip between the pictures. There was something intimate about peeling back the tracing paper and dressing the pictures. Rapunzel's hair is cut. The eagle plucks out his heart. The princess pricks her finger. There were always princes and princesses. They were the special people, more important than the other characters in their stories. We knew we were like that. Twins, magical. We were the princesses. We had a poster of Princess Diana from the newspaper up in our attic. I had a pride of place. And underneath we used to put all our special things. When her engagement was announced, we were obsessed with everything she did. And later, when her life went so bad, we felt for her. Her divorce last year just kind of drew a line under things. When beautiful people died, we always felt like it was a sign. You remember Princess Grace, Grace Kelly? She died in a car crash the year before we met Simon. We used a Ouija board to speak to her, and that gave us the power to find him. That's what we thought then, that people who die tragically leave some kind of magic behind. We used to share dreams. We used to wake up and write them down in our diaries immediately and compare them. Mum and Dad never knew what was going on. We got so good at it. We were so in sync that we'd use each other to cheat. If one of us had a hangover, the other one would go to school. Whoever was best at a subject would sit the exam. There were lots of differences between us. Some things one is better than the other at. Differences? She's a better driver than me. She passed the test for us. I tried to take it and nearly crash the car. <laughs> Learned that you can't rely on confidence to get you through everything. Mm, she is the shy one. She was especially shy around boys. If Hannah liked a boy, I would have to pursue him. It was that way with Carl. Hannah met him first. She had such a crush. I let him take my virginity after night that his band had played at. It got difficult. When I was with Carl, we would have sex, but Hannah couldn't. Couldn't let him see she was a virgin. She had lots of excuses. After a while, we decided that I should take Hannah's virginity. It's not that different to a bruise, pulling a tooth, a graze. We used a hairbrush. After that, we took him in turns, though. I was always the one who seduced the boys. Until Simon. Hannah was so smitten with Simon. She started getting jealous. Didn't want to share. Even the first date. We went to see Tom Cruise at the Old Odeon. We both went kept changing places in the toilet. We only had one best dress, so we had to keep swapping clothes. Must have thought we had terrible bladder problems. The next date, it was my turn. Um, at the end, I let him kiss me, but that was it. We didn't want another car on our hands, and the Ouija board had said to hold back. After that, it was Hannah's turn, and she slept with him broke the rules, deliberately broke the rules. She wanted to be the first to sleep with him. 
I mean, that's when she got pregnant. From that one time. Can you imagine? I tried. I tried to get pregnant too, but it didn't happen. I slept with so many boys, men. My body refused. I think my period stopped because hers had. I was pretty ill. I mean, how could we stay the same now? I felt like Hannah had really fucked things up. Set us down separate paths. We had become different. No. The parents decided there would be a wedding. And after the wedding, Hannah moved in with his parents. There was no way I could follow. So we were separated again. I stayed in the attic. It was hard. It's like I suddenly didn't exist. I would sneak out, but in case anyone recognised me, I started wearing a wig. Hannah and I would meet up in the park. I was trying to get pregnant. But I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't do it with anyone we knew, so it was sex with strangers. Drunk guys I'd met in clubs, in parks and alleyways. I was 17. It felt like I was being punished. But it was Hannah who had betrayed us. I had to stop when one of the guys gave me an STD. When we met up, it was disturbing. For the first time, my reflection, she didn't look like me. She was fatter, flushed. If anything, I was getting skinnier. I had a hard to look sometimes. We talked about what to do. Was it time to become our own people? I mean, that seemed like the right thing to do, but neither of us wanted it. We agreed that her and Simon would get their own place as soon as possible, and then I could move in. And that was the plan. Hannah had a miscarriage. This was late in the pregnancy and it left her infertile. Felt like the universe had corrected its course. We were aligned again. But Hannah and Simon were still living with his parents. They were married. Simon had a job at the Glaciers now. Derek had given him a full-time position after he left school. And then... I was living in the attic. It was a very hard time. I was depressed. I was still pretty sick of the STD. When I came down one morning, they were dead. They were in bed and both had been sick. They'd thrown up a lot. And I'd slept through it. The police said it was mushrooms they ate. Dad was a mushroom expert. I mean, he used to take us picking with him and he taught us how to recognise them. There's no way you would have picked death caps. But the police believe that's what happened. They never even looked in the attic. Yes, it was a cremation for the best. We both wore black and had veils, so it was easy. 
And after the funeral, everyone came back to the house. Heidi served up sandwiches. And I stayed out of sight. The legal stuff was completed very quickly. Hannah moved back in with Simon. Eric gave Simon the week off to help with the move. He decorated, modernised wallpaper curtains. Hannah insists the attic be left as it was, dollhouse and all. Simon never went up there. It lasted about six months. I tried to carry on, but everything was different. Hannah insisted I not pretend to be her around Simon, let alone sleep with him. We didn't share him like the others. The rules had changed. Me living in the attic had become weird in a way it hadn't been before. So I moved out. Got a small bed set. Got my tattoo to mark the occasion. I was singing in a bar in the evenings, so I had some money, enough money to cover my rent. And I've been doing something similar ever since. I haven't put down any roots. I don't exist. He saw me singing, one of my shows, pure chance. Not sure I remember what he was even doing there. Afterwards, I had a drink at the bar and he came over and we got talking. I knew who he was. Obviously I knew who he was, but he didn't know who I was. He was fascinated by the likeness. Guessed my name for my tattoo. <laughs> Told me it was a palindrome, well, that would impress me. I enjoyed talking to him. It was amazing to be able to sit and interact and talk to him after all this time. He didn't tell me he was married. I'm not sure what he was thinking. He later told me it was like he was dreaming. A waking dream. No. No, he wasn't wearing his wedding ring. Nothing else happened that night. We talked, then I said goodbye. Then next week I was sitting in the bar again and there he was. And again the next week, he offered to buy me a meal. I told them I had already eaten um, and so we got chips and ate them on the beach instead. When we said goodbye, he asked me to kiss him. <laughs> Romantic. Yes. I thought about telling Hannah I felt guilty after the kiss. But then it began to feel like this was the way it should be. Sharing, like we had before. He never mentioned her to me. There was the Simon with me and the Simon with her. It was almost like it was a different Simon. But... After the kiss, the next time, he took me back to the house, to our parents' house, to their house. So, it was definitely him. <laughs> I sometimes think he wanted to get caught to prove to himself that we were different people. He told me about his marriage, told me how his wife was completely different to me. <laughs> I 
I'm going to start laughing. I think it was that time, the first time, at the house, in his bed, that I got pregnant. Amazing, right? This fucking magic spell. And they say lightning doesn't strike twice. I didn't tell him. I missed three periods. I had pretty irregular periods anyway, but three. I had always thought we were infertile. Both of us. I didn't tell him. I just waited. Hannah and I were meeting for our birthday and I told her because I thought she would be happy for us both. I think she was. No. I told her it was one of my boyfriends, someone I had met in the bar. I think she was happy. But I could tell she was thinking, why couldn't it happen to her and Simon? They were the ones with the real life. Why not them? Then she told me she wanted to help more. She said I should move in with her. She would come clean with Simon about me. I was family. I couldn't have a baby in a bed set. I told her I didn't want to tell Simon. Told her to wait for the time being. When she went home, Simon had a birthday tea waiting. Afterwards, she told Simon about me, told him I was pregnant. She wanted me to move in with them, this sister he didn't know she had. She knew that instant. The look on his face. She sent him out of the house, kicked him out, called me up, crying, and I went round. I guess I had a feeling I could hear something was wrong in her voice, but I wasn't sure what it was. She called me sister on the phone. She never calls me that. This was nine, about nine. I went round and she was waiting for me. She was furious and so angry, the kind of anger you can only have towards yourself. We screamed at each other, argued, cried, we fought. I hit her back, left a bruise. I had my wig on from performing, she tore it off. Eventually, we grew tired of fighting and I left. Like I told you before, I drove. I took the car and drove. I don't have my own car, but I have a spare set of keys. I just drove north. I wanted to think for some space between me and them. Everything I told you before is true. I stopped at Glasgow. I was tired, exhausted. I pulled out and I hit a car. My car was okay, but I was worried about the baby, so I went to A&E to get the okay. Everything was fine. I slept in the car. When I woke, I tried to call Hannah from a payphone. She wasn't answering. And then I decided to drive back. I had decided that she was more important to me than Simon. Like I said before, it was three. Something like that. I walked in. Saw Simon. He was on the floor of the living room. His throat had been cut. There was a lot of blood. Yeah, he was dead.
She was sat behind him. She had my wig on. And she'd been there all day. And she had blood on her. And she was in shock. Her story is that she'd waited for him to come back. She put on my wig, some of my clothes, pretended to be me. They talked. She'd enjoyed being me. He said he wanted to be with me. Then he took out a present, another mirror just like the one he'd given her earlier. <laughs> that unique present. She went crazy, smashed the mirror. They argued, screamed. He hit her. So she grabbed a piece of the mirror and just swung it round. She cut his throat clean open. She'd only meant to scare him off. It happened very quickly. We hardly had to talk to each other. We agreed almost silently. The baby was what mattered. We'd help each other. We cleaned up. We bagged up the broken mirror, her clothes. They're gone. We took him down to the cellar. We knew I, we had an alibi and we wanted the body to be found later. We wanted to have suspicion on us so we could then disprove it rather than have it linger. Better to keep the body in the house than risk being seen with it. The watch, that was my touch to make sure the alibi stuck. My sister is gone. And she's never coming back. Can you arrest someone who doesn't exist? I'd like to speak to a lawyer now. Please. You have no murder weapon. You have nothing. And all these stories we've been telling each other. Just that. Stories. Okay. Well, I have quite a few thoughts to say and also a couple keywords to look up. Yeah, watching that in order really, really does make it make a lot more sense. Having everything in context with what we know and also just especially just having the statements in the correct order. That alone makes it make a lot more sense. I want to rewatch a couple of these right now, right here at the end. It happened very quickly. We My sister is gone. And she's never coming back. Okay, so what she's saying is that the fact that they were, well, supposedly, this is, this is all supposedly, but the fact that they were twins meant that they had an, and the fact that they looked like each other, you know, because they are twins and nobody really knew, that's what gave them the alibi. That's why she said, we knew we had an alibi. Because when the murder happened, Eve had driven away to Glasgow, I believe it was. Yeah, she had driven away in Glasgow, in her car, in Hannah's car, because she had a spare set of the keys to it. And she had hit somebody, and she had gone to the hospital. So that was her alibi. That's why she said, we knew we had an alibi. That would be the alibi for Hannah. That was their plan. But then she says this. My sister is gone. And she's never coming back.
Can you arrest someone who doesn't exist? And then she says... I'd like to speak to a lawyer now. Please. You have no murder weapon. You have nothing. And all these stories we've been telling each other... Just that. Stories. Now at first I thought when she said my sister's gone and she's never coming back, can you arrest someone who doesn't exist? At first I thought that she was saying everything I just told you was a lie about us being twins. You know, my my sister doesn't exist or something like that. But I don't think that's actually what she's saying. She's telling the detective, basically. I mean, she's blowing open her alibi, right? Their alibi only worked if the police don't know that Eve and Hannah are two different people. They only work if the police only knew about Hannah. That's the only way the alibi would work. She's giving up the alibi. She's no, she knows, you know, that's it's too late. She can't keep up the alibi anymore. They know. So, I'm thinking maybe because of that, Hannah ran away. Maybe that's what she means by her, my sister's gone, she's never coming back. She ran away. You know, they knew it was, it was over. Their lie was over. So, she ran and hid. And then when she says, can you arrest someone who doesn't exist? I don't feel like she's saying, can you arrest, um, you know, my sister doesn't exist, so you can't arrest her. I think she's talking about herself, because she has never really existed, right? She's been off the off the radar for her entire life, and she's never put down any roots. Eve basically doesn't exist. So I feel like she's saying... And she's never coming back. She ran away, and then she's saying... Can you arrest someone who doesn't exist? Kind of almost laughing, because the idea is kind of ridiculous of arresting her, Eve, when she doesn't really exist. I'd like to speak to a lawyer now. Please. You have no murder weapon. You have nothing. And all these stories we've been telling each other... Just that. Stories. I don't know how she intends to get away with it, given everything she just told the detectives, but... I think that's what she's saying. My sister ran away. And the sister is the one who actually did the murder, so I guess Hannah, or Eve, is hoping that... She won't be charged with anything, or nothing too serious. You know, not charged with the murder. Obviously, she's still guilty of at least obstruction of justice, or something like that. At least. Although she also said she helped clean up the body, so that's got to be something else, too. Uh, I still think that they are actually two people, and the twins actually exist, and this isn't some sort of, sort of, multiple identity sort of thing. Okay, so yeah, some other thoughts. Um... The two things really stuck out to me, watching all of these things back to back. One is that her story her story is convenient. Eve's story is very, very convenient. It's very convenient because almost none of it can be proved. Right? I mean, she doesn't have a birth certificate, you know, she doesn't exist. Um, the uh, Florence's diary that mentioned Eve existing, and that entire thing of, you know, taking Eve from the mother, and all of that. That diary, which was, I guess, the only real proof that such a thing happened. She said after she read the diary, she burned it, right? So great, there's the evidence. Burned. Who else, uh, you know, how else could you prove that Eve actually even existed and this thing actually happened? Well, let's see, you could speak to Florence. Oh, Florence died. She fell down the stairs. Diary burned. Florence died. It's conveniently hard to prove that she even exists, isn't it? It's very strange. That puts me more towards the side of thinking that she doesn't even really exist, and this is actually one person. 
but all the things I mentioned previously make me think that, no, these are separate people. And the whole tattoo thing... Yeah, just, hmm. I don't know, but I'm still leaning towards her actually being... Uh, them actually being two different people. But it is suspicious. Her story is very convenient in its unprovableness. And the other thing is, assuming they are actually different people, I'm more suspicious now that she is actually the one who killed Florence and the one who killed her parents with the death cap mushroom. Because that was also very convenient. So... By... You know, after Florence died, that meant that Eve didn't have anywhere to stay. And that's when she moved into the attic at Hannah's place. Right? She wanted to get... We know that she wanted to be in sync with Hannah and that she wanted to be closer to Hannah. So it's very plausible that she would push Florence down the stairs to kill her. Because then she would have to find a new place to live and could move in with Hannah. And same thing for poisoning her parents with the death cap mushroom. She was living with her parents in the attic, and I, I think at the time, Hannah was living with Simon somewhere else, so she was apart from Hannah again. But after her parents died from the death cap mushroom poisoning, the house passed, uh, the will of the house passed it down to Hannah, and so Hannah and Simon moved into it, once again, placing Eve close to Hannah. I think she did that. I think she pushed Florence down the stairs and poisoned her parents to get closer to Hannah. But if she did do that, then what does that mean for the murder? Did she then kill Simon? I really don't know. I really don't know. Do I believe her story? Well, I strongly suspect she did kill Florence and her parents, but... I don't feel like she killed Simon, weirdly enough. Yeah, I don't. Okay, um, I'm going to search for a couple of the keywords that I thought of. Let's see if we can find anything new. It's unlikely. Okay, picture? No. Special? No. Divorce? No. Park? Nope. Okay. Those are the only keywords I wanted to try. Nothing. Once again, I've gotten almost everything from the database. A couple small bits and one big chunk, and this one big chunk is, I believe, the missing volume. So I don't think you can actually access it at all. So, yeah, I don't know. I, like, I can't be sure what happened, but I've got a, some strong, strong things that I suspect. I believe she's telling the truth for the most part, except with the only change being that I think she killed Florence and her parents. Aside from that, I think everything she said seems plausible. You know, something somebody, I, I believe somebody suggested this in the comments for one of the previous videos, is that perhaps they were, you know, the fact that this is so confusing for me to try to understand and make sense of, maybe that's exactly what they were going for, Eve and Hannah. Maybe they were trying to not just confuse me, but confuse the detective, confuse the police. Maybe they were deliberately imitating each other and making this weird story that makes it hard to figure out who did what. On purpose. Because if there's a reasonable doubt, then maybe they could both avoid, you know, either of them being seriously punished for this. Maybe they were trying to create confusion. It's possible. So, I don't know, but I feel like I understand the story well enough to, uh, to end it. I wonder if something more is going to happen when I end the game. Or if that literally is just the end. I don't know, but I feel pretty good now. I, f I feel pretty satisfied, for the most part. Alright, let's do it.
Your mother. You think you understand why your mother did what she did? Okay. So I was thinking either I am the kid, you know, this is about 21 years after these uh, these interrogations were filmed. I was thinking either I was the kid that was growing inside of Eve, or I'm one of the sisters looking back at this 20 years later. Looks like... Looks like I am the kid. I think you understand why your mother did what she did. What can I type in? <laughs> you can say yes or you can say no. You're limited in what you can type. You can't type anything. You can only type yes or no. Do I think I understand why she did what she did? Yeah. Actually, I think I do. I'm glad, Sarah. But waiting outside, log off and we can meet over the road. Sarah. So that's my name, Sarah. Wasn't there a mention of a Sarah? I would have been a good mother. I was young, but I would have been a good mother. She was a girl, by the way, the baby. We were going to call her Sarah. Simon wanted to call her Ava after his nana, but I didn't want her to have a symmetrical name. <laughs> I don't know if that's funny or bittersweet or what. Just to mention the symmetrical name, just... <laughs> okay, so... So it looks like, um... Yeah... Hannah's baby that she miscarried with was going to be called Sarah, and it looks like Eve called her daughter Sarah to to honor Hannah. It's pretty brilliant the way this has been constructed here. After after calling me Sarah, I think they constructed it so that they know you're going to search for Sarah, and there's only one clip that pops up, you know. Wow, who knew this clip that I had already seen was going to be basically the ending clip? It makes such a good ending clip now, and it... Oh, God. Who knew this seemingly innocuous kind of random clip would be <laughs> the end? But that feels like it's closing the book right there. I would have been a good mother. I was young, but I would have been a good mother. She was a girl, by the way, the baby. We were going to call her Sarah. Simon wanted to call her Ava after his nana, but I didn't want her to have a symmetrical name. Well, there you go. That has been her story. That was one hell of a game. It's very, very, very... Mm, the way it's constructed is both brilliant and also maddening. It's fascinating and... It starts off really strongly. 
and it kind of like goes up and down like the very like the first half of the game is great because no matter what you search for you're gonna find new stuff and you're gonna have all these moments where it's like oh god now that makes sense and oh my god these like revelation moments like there's twins and oh Florence in the attic and they pretended to be each other and all this stuff you know there's there's all these aha moments that you're pretty much guaranteed to have for like the first half but then the second half is really uneven because you just, it starts to get harder and harder to find stuff and it gets more frustrating and more more tedious to find stuff and the aha moments start to come less frequently and it just starts to feel like I'm beating my head against a wall and I don't like I don't feel like I would really have closure right now if I hadn't have put that final interview with Eve into order if I hadn't have put that into order and watched the whole thing back to back I don't feel like I would have had a satisfying ending but the problem is to actually do that required like an hour or so an hour to maybe an hour and 20 minutes of incredibly mind-numbing tedious work trying to assemble those clips into the right order and the fact that I had to do that to get a satisfying ending is just eh. like that really sucked so it's very uneven the pacing of it the pacing of the information that you get and how hard it is to find information. Sarah, so if you're stuck, you could always try admin random. Hmm? Admin random? Does that do what I think it does? Hello, new clip. Does it always give you a new clip, or does it literally just give you a random clip? I haven't been into work. I've been... I mean, I guess I've just been waiting. Waiting to hear from you. Hear from my husband. That's during the missing persons report. Looks like I have to type it in every time. Oh wow, okay, it gives you a new clip. Not just a random clip, it gives you a random new clip. Alright, let's watch the rest of them. Okay, I'll try my best to remember. Yeah, so I'm guessing most of the ones I'm missing are probably going to be inconsequential, because they're probably very short. Uh, let me see if I can copy-paste this. Oh, you can't. Oh, wait, what the? Oh, you can. That's weird. Didn't quite work before. I did. Well, we met when we were 17, both working at the glaciers. Wait, that one I've already seen. Okay. Sounds weird. I'm mean, not great at making up stories. Hmm. I'm not great at making up stories. So that's the whole Rapunzel thing, right? Or maybe not the Rapunzel thing, but the thing where they showed her like a picture and they wanted her to make up a story about it. It sounds like they wanted to know, like they suspected she was making up everything. And I guess they wanted to see if she was really good at that. And that's why they were testing her with that. Like, let's see if she can just make up a story out of nothing or something. I think that's what they're trying to do. That's weird. It mostly gives me new ones, but some of them I've already seen. Wait, is it actually truly random then? No, it's showing me way too many new clips for this to actually be random. Oh, it tastes fine to me. As long as it's black and strong, I'm good. It was late. Early Saturday morning. Yeah, so these just seem to be quick, inconsequential ones. At least keep going. Hmm. 
It doesn't... There's no way this is truly random. This is strange. In the bedroom. It's showing me way too many new ones for this to actually be random. No. That can't be right. In the bedroom. In the bedroom. What about the bedroom? In the bedroom. That can't be right. Okay. I parked up in the street. It was busy. Hmm. No. Simon wasn't seeing another woman. Hurt someone? Yes. But everyone thinks that from time to time, right? You just want to lash out. Yes. <laughs> We've got our answers to the lie detector, but we don't know the questions. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, oh, wait. So that's not the missing volume. That came from the, the missing volume. At least what I thought was the missing volume. It's not. That's her... You freaking information teases. That's just a whole lot of yes, no, no, yes. Oh my god, it's just the answers to the lie detector, which are only yes or no. And we don't know the questions. You. You can't even... You can't even find them. There's no, You can't use other keywords to narrow them down. That's why I couldn't find them. Yes and no has too many results, and you can't use more keywords, because the only thing she says is yes or no. Do you have children? Simon was very moral about that sort of thing. He wouldn't just walk out there and sleep with anyone. He wasn't that kind of guy. He took his marriage very seriously. And the hotel said he was there? Yep, all the rest of the ones are just from this, this damn <laughs> lie detector. Sorry, yeah, I get it, I get it. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fuck you, game. No. <sighs> Five more. Yes. The credit said something about an unlock code, didn't it? I don't I don't know what that was about. Yes. No. No. <laughs> One more. I can take this stuff off now. Did I prove I'm innocent? And there you go. Yeah.
none of that was really important stuff. It's mostly what I thought it was, just very short clips that are hard to search for. That's it. That's it. So yeah, just to resummarize what I was saying, um, it's a, a brilliant and fascinating game that is... It's very open in what you can do, because it really doesn't constrain the way you find information very much. It's very freeform. And in being so freeform, it also leaves the pacing up to, well, pretty much random chance as to whether, you, whether you'll get good pacing or bad pacing. It just depends on what you find first, really, in the order that you find it in, and it's going to be different for everybody. For me, it was really good up until maybe the halfway point, and then it just started to kind of go downhill from there and get more and more tedious. It's a damn interesting game. I've never played anything like it. And I really like it. As for what happened, is her story true? I still don't know. But I've got my own interpretation, and I'm reasonably confident in it, enough to be satisfied with the story. Enough to not feel like I'm leaving it completely open-ended, with no idea what's going on. I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on the story. But yeah, if you have any different interpretations, and I'm sure a lot of people do, then please go ahead and let me know, you know? Tell me in the comments, tell everybody else in the comments, and let's let's compare interpretations. So, I hope you have enjoyed watching me play through her story, and thank you for watching.